bucks up down to 62, so we picked up over five grand in giving. So <laughs> praise the Lord for that. We're thanking God for that. We got five more months to budget year. And, and please, you know, I'm a numbers guy, so it, maybe this is kind of dry for you, for me to talk about this, but it's exciting that we've done that. Okay, it is. You know, I'm the financial guy, but God is, is working in your hearts. And so with, with that, I say, you know, I'm just going to end my, my segment here by saying, you know, give uh, generously, give regularly, give cheerfully, and be generous. And Trent, would you like to come here now? I cannot mess that end up a little bit there, oh, but good. I got her. So I love ahead. Matt. Matt is so comfortable with this. the microphone. You can take it back down to Jacob if you want. Getting up in front of people is Matt's favorite thing in the world to do. It absolutely is. But uh, anyway, we are gr grateful for Matt and uh, grateful for y'all, uh, your giving, your faithfulness, generosity, sacrifice. And uh, we just believe this, that if, if everybody just does what God asks them to do, then the finances at Zion will be taken care of and we'll be able to dream and, and, and do all the things that, uh, that we feel God's asked us to do. So thank you all for that. Hey, I got a couple of things I want to bring up <clears throat> before we pause and pray. <clears throat> and then we'll jump into our kingdom story uh, message. Uh, that th this is be this will be a first here for most everybody in the room for both of these announcements. You all know uh, about my friendship with Jason Hunter at First Baptist Church in Clarion. We've become best of friends over the last ten years or so. Uh, our youth ministries partner together, so we have a combined student ministry: First Baptist Church in Clarion and Zion Church. Uh, our teenagers meet every Sunday night at First Baptist. Uh, they they uh, come to kids camp with us. Uh, they do a lot of things. We do a lot of things together. They're involved in the Keystone Family Alliance. Uh, they're one of the first churches that jumped into Love, Inc. So there's a deep, real connection between us. Well, we want to continue to foster that. And Jason came to me a couple months ago and, and had an idea for us to do something together at Easter. Now, this is not the Good Friday communion service that all of the League of Pastors go to. What he proposed is getting together on Thursday evening. Historically, First Baptist Church has always done what they call a, a, tenebrae, thurs, uh, a tenebrae service. Some of you might know what that is, a Maundy Thursday service uh, where they have dinner and they have a service together. They've been doing that at First Baptist Church for years. And what they proposed was, hey, we'll move our gathering to Zion and we'll do a dinner here at Zion with First Baptist Church. First Baptist Church is actually going to take the lead with the meal, all right? But in addition to doing a meal together, we'll have a gathering, a service, which will feel a little different. As a matter of fact, it's going to feel super different because it's actually going to be, for the lack of a better way to describe it, a dinner theater uh, feel with an organization called The Piercing Word. I want you to take a quick peek at a, a highlight video of, of the piercing word and what they're actually going to bring here uh, on that evening as part of our dinner gathering, um, Bondi Thursday, Tenebrae uh, service. Take a look at this real quick. Jesus knew God's plan for salvation <clears throat> and the sacrifice it required. Yet his love for the Father and the world moved him forward. In this word-for-word -word musical presentation of the Easter story, experience the Last Supper trial. Crucify him. I find no guilt in him. Crucifixion. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And resurrection of Jesus. All set against the backdrop of Old Testament prophecies, with original music and passages spanning all four gospel accounts, as well as Psalm 23 and Isaiah 53. Passion the Musical utilizes a modern-day urban concept to offer a compelling look at the sacrificial heart of God and His power over sin and death. May this Easter season be one of renewed passion and joy because of the resurrected Christ and the hope of the gospel that's offered to all. Passion the Musical. So something different and something that we want you to go ahead and circle on your calendar. You're going to hear more about it. We'll have to register because we'll have to reserve seats. And then uh, once we kind of get the word around, we'll promote it to even to our community. And we want you to bring, uh, bring friends. But it'll be a nice, nice evening. We'll have to share a nice meal and then, and then watch this performance. And again, it's an opportunity for us to build bridges with brothers and sisters uh, in, in another uh, church family. So I wanted to let you know about that. You'll be hearing more about that in weeks to come. Speaking of uh, new things, I also want to 
uh, let you know that this past week we began the process of getting the word out for something else that we're hosting here at Zion in April, uh, which is the Church Mental Health Summit. Uh, the Church Mental Health Summit is something that uh, Jessica Hansford, the CEO at uh, Clarion Psychiatric Center, uh, and myself, Jessica and her family, has been attending here since uh, she arrived uh, here in Clarion uh, to, to partner together to build bridges between the, the faith community and the mental health community. Uh, because I believe that the faith community, that churches need to lean in when it comes to uh, issues of mental health. And we have tried to do that uh, over the last several years. We're still learning, we're, lo we're growing, but we know this, that we are holistic humans, that God created us mind, body, soul, spirit, and there are a lot of people that we encounter, uh, many of, even in this room, who when I say mental health, you, you would lean in and go, yep, <laughs> I'm in that group, right? But the, the truth of the matter is a lot of folks suffer with depression and anxiety and, and other um, uh, mental health diagnosis. And we, we want to be a church that, that always destigmatizes that and that recognizes that the faith community has a voice uh, to play, uh, a part to play in, in addressing kind of those messy places of life that sometimes uh, churches just aren't really sure where and how to step in. And so to that end, we're going to do this summit uh, that's going to be in a, a combination of live speakers and virtual speakers, live speakers. Jessica is going to speak. Sam is going to speak. I'm going to do a short talk. And then we're going to, uh, through video, uh, have sessions with some nationally recognized speakers. Uh, we're inviting the human service community to come. But our focus really is on churches, pastors, church leaders, life groups, small groups, Sunday school teachers. We really want anybody who interfaces with somebody or many somebodies who might have uh, mental health struggles. And so I'm, I'm going to you know, put it out to everybody at Zion. You're all welcome to come. I know it's on a Wednesday, so some of your schedules won't allow for that. But if it, if it does and you can rearrange things or take a day off work or your workflow allows you to do that, it's, it's going to be a really instructive, um, educational, equipping, resourcing day. Uh, and, and I would love for you to come. There's a, the registration fee, I think, is $20. And that includes also lunch uh, that we'll, we'll have available here. Uh, so help get, get the word around. If you see me pushing it out on social media, click that share button and put it on your, on your Facebook page uh, and say, hey, our church is going to be hosting this. We'd love for you to come. Um, but but this, is, this is in connection with our heart for collaboration. We want to collaborate however and whenever with other churches in the community. And this isn't, this isn't a church growth summit. This is not something we're doing to grow our church. We're doing this to build up the kingdom and to resource uh, and, and, and hopefully uh, equip and, and give some confidence to other churches and other church leaders and lay leaders um, who just want to be better at ministering to those who, who deal with uh, mental health issues. So uh, you'll hear more about that uh, to come. Uh, and so having said that, why don't we make that our pause and pray? If you're new or newish design, we always... Uh, build in a time for you to pray, for sometimes us to pray out loud publicly. But what I want to do today for our pause and pray is just ask you to, to pray for that summit, to pray for uh, its effectiveness, to pray that God would use it to, to equip, train, resource uh, other churches, leaders, pastors uh, in, in, in our faith communities uh, around Clarion County. And uh, then we'll jump right into the message today. So let's pause and let's pray together. Have you ever had to call a customer service hotline number to have an, an issue resolved? Anybody ever have to call, right? And after being bounced around from 
department to the department, from person to person, after enduring you know, long hold times, every representative that you talk to, they give you, you know, uh, conflicting information, and at the end of the day, they're unable to solve your problem. Have you ever had that experience? I mean, those kind of experiences leave you frustrated, irritated, sometimes downright angry, and it leaves you just wanting to know the answer to this question. Who's in charge? Who, who's in charge of this place? Or, or maybe you've had this, this experience. You've attended a meeting at work where several coworkers are discussing a project, but nobody seems to have a clear agenda. Uh, the meeting becomes kind of chaotic. Uh, the discussion uh, amongst people, everybody's talking over each other, and, and the, the meeting quickly goes off the rails. The lack of direction and focus leaves you frustrated and irritated and agitated and maybe even a little angry, and you're wondering to yourself or maybe even saying out loud, who's in charge? Another one, maybe you're a college student, and you've been assigned a group project for a class. But as the deadline for the project approaches, it's clear that there were some team members in your group who weren't pulling their weight and didn't contribute as much. And because nobody is stepping up to take control, uh, so the project gets done on time, tensions begin to rise, and they leave you frustrated, irritated, agitated, questioning Who's in charge? Or one more. You visit a government office. Insert punchline already, right? But you visit a government office to renew your driver's license or passport or to handle some other task, right? Upon arrival, you're greeted by long lines and disorganized processes. And staff members seem overwhelmed, which then leads to slow service and lots and lots of confusion. Despite your attempts to ask for assistance or to ask for clarification, no one seems to have the authority to to streamline the process, which leaves you agitated, questioning, and wondering who's in charge, right? And some of you guys are all stressed out right now. You're breaking out in a cold sweat over some of these things. You know, the truth is it it can and, and often is frustrating when you encounter a situation where you just don't know who's in charge. Or we can actually put it another way. Who has the authority, right? Who has the authority? The authority to lead, the, the, the authority to make a decision, the, the authority to give direction, the authority to provide clear instructions. You know, back in Jesus' day, there were uh, some people, some groups of people who possessed real authority, spiritual authority. And the truth is, they didn't just wield spiritual power, but it spilled over into the world of politics. And these same groups had political power and influence. And some of those groups you're familiar with, the Pharisees, right? The Pharisees were this group of people that, uh, religious leaders that Jesus often confronted and did battle with. Then there were, was another group called the chief priests. They were all priests from the line of, uh, from the tribe and line of Levi. And they, they had specific responsibilities inside of the temple. But they had lots of influence, lots of authority, lots of power. And then there were the, the, the elders. And the elders were simply the highly respected older uh, usually are always men in a community. And, and the people, the, the commoners, the citizens, by and large, simply fell in line with their authority. No, no questions asked. They just accepted the authority and the direction and the leadership of those religious and community leaders. But then <clears throat> along comes Jesus. Jesus. And if you take the time to read the Gospels, much of his teaching, a lot of things that he actually said, called into question and cut against the spiritual authority of those groups, of those different groups of people. They, he challenged them time and time again. 
the, the series that we're in right now, Kingdom Stories, where we're talking about the, the parables of Jesus, where he, he talks about his kingdom, right, really is a series about who has authority in my life, right? That, that's really what this series is about. It's, it's about helping us to wrestle with who has authority or asking ourselves the question, when it comes to my life, who's in charge? And by way of review, if you remember correctly, we talked about and defined the kingdom this way, is wherever Jesus is king, wherever Jesus is given authority, wherever Jesus rules, there is the kingdom. And, and that all starts with us personally giving him rule, putting him in charge of our own lives. See, the question of authority, the question of who is in charge is huge in our day. We have seen the culture shift over the years, right? From the, from the rebellion of the 60s, the, the hippie generation, right? To today where, where we talk often about my truth. What is my truth? As though we are the final authority of everything that happens around us. But here's the thing. When we became followers of Jesus... Or for some of you, when you make the decision to become a follower of Jesus, and this may not have been taught when you became a follower of Jesus, but anybody who is thinking about, wrestling with, becoming a follower of Jesus, I don't want to pull a bait and switch on you. I want to be up front with you. But following Jesus has always been about changing who has authority. Who has the final say in our lives? And giving up authority of our life to someone else absolutely cuts against our own sense of of autonomy, the idea that we are ultimately in charge, self-rule. And again, you, you put that on top of the fact that this is America, and we pride ourselves on our autonomy on the fact that nobody will tell me what to do. Nobody tells us what to do. The idea of being a follower of Jesus who gives up authority to him exclusively is not an easy thing to to wrestle with. It's not an easy thing at times to talk about and consider, but make no mistake about it. Apprenticing to Jesus, becoming a disciple, a follower of Jesus, is about giving him absolute power, absolute control, absolute authority in our lives. Now, having said that, open to Matthew chapter 21 in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, please stop at our First Impressions desk on your way out. We want to give you a copy of the scriptures. We'll put these verses up on the screen as we work through a good chunk of Matthew chapter 21. If you've read the the book of Matthew lately, Matthew 21 kind of marks this pick up the pace point in the story. If, if Matthew was a movie, this is when, when the intensity would build up. This is when the music would start getting a little bit more intense. This is when you know, each of the shots would become you know, just a little bit more herky-jerky because of the pace uh, that, that, that starts in Matthew 21. This really marks a significant turning point in the ministry of Jesus. And again, just to kind of get a picture of Matthew 21, what's going on, uh, it's the week before the Passover, which is one of the biggest days of the year for for Israel, for the Jewish people. Uh, During Passover, all of the Jewish men were commanded to make their way uh, to the temple, to, to visit the temple. It would have been during this week that Jerusalem, where the temple was located, would have been filled with Jewish families from all over the known world. Estimates would say that there were 700,000 people in the city of Jerusalem during the week of Passover. They were there living any place that they could find space, right? I mean, it's Woodstock meets Lollapalooza meets whatever festival you're familiar with. People are just standing on top of each other, putting up pop tents, getting their little, you know, their, their, their little uh, uh, cooking devices out. They're doing whatever they can just to find some space uh, to, to be in the city because that was where they had to be. 
adding to the excitement as Matthew chapter 21 opens, we read about the triumphant entry. Jesus comes into the city proclaiming to be the king, not a king like they were expecting, right? But the fact that everybody lined the streets and was waving palm branches, uh, again, only kings do that, and Jesus was okay with it, but he knew that as king, what was coming, right? And so as he makes his way into Jerusalem, you keep reading, he goes in and he cleanses the temple. He says, look, my house is, is, is a house of prayer. You've turned it into a, a den of robbers. He upsets everybody with that statement. And what happens from that point on, and really if you just kind of read through the rest of, of Matthew's gospel, it's this back and forth. It's this climactic exchange between Jesus and those groups of people, the Pharisees and the elders and the chief priests who had the authority in the city. They had control. They had the seats of power and influence. It was just this back and forth between Jesus and those groups. Think, you know, old school, Western, you know, the the white-hatted cowboy against the cowboy in the black hats kind of standing off, right? Uh, it, it, think football game, you know, two titans battling each other. You think if you're not a football person, MMA or, you know, WWE, but it's just this standoff. And really the, the standoff is between Jesus and those religious leaders, or say it another way, God's way versus man's way. And it's really became a, 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 a battle of authority. One group said that they had it and didn't want to let it go, and Jesus was there rem- reminding them, that ultimately, you are not in charge. And so today, we're actually going to read <clears throat> and look at two parables that Jesus spoke specifically to this group of people. A lot of the other parables that we've looked at in this series, he's talking to his disciples or he's talking to, to a crowd or a group of people. He is addressing this group with these two parables. He told these things to confront them directly. It's important that we understand that. This is who he is talking to. However, however, some 2,000 years later, these stories don't just inform us. They have implications for us. They have applications for our life as we, still 2,000 years later, have to wrestle with, on a personal level, who has authority? Who, who has the ultimate authority? authority in my life. Let's start reading in verse 23 of Matthew chapter 1, just to give you a little bit of context. And when he, Jesus, entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus answered them, I will also ask you one question. And if you tell me the answer, then I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, John the Baptist. From where did it come? From heaven or from man? And they got in a little huddle and they kind of got in a circle and they put their arms around each other and they discussed it among themselves saying, hey, um, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say from man, we're afraid of the crowd. Because they all hold that John was a prophet. So they break the huddle, they go back to Jesus, and they answer Jesus, and they say, "Uh, we don't know. We don't have an answer for you, Jesus. And he says to them, neither will I tell you by what authority we do these things, or I do these things. Had he told them, he would have gotten arrested immediately. He wasn't ready to be arrested. He still had some work to do. So he, he asked this question to buy himself a little bit of time because he still knew that his mission wasn't completely done. He wasn't ready to be arrested. So again, let's think about it. He's at this temple. He's at, he arrives at the temple to teach. And I, and I think we minimize the, the, the importance of the temple uh, to the Jewish people. Um, it wasn't just a church building for them. It was the center of life. It was, it was the center of political life. It was the, the center of, of social life. It was the center of, obviously, spiritual life. And, and maybe this is not a good way to think about it, but if you could, if it were possible, to take Washington, D.C. and New York City 
and Hollywood, and if we were Catholic, the Vatican, and you put them all together, you just kind of put them all together in one, please shake them up and, and, and see what pops out, that would kind of signify how important, how, how essential life in, around uh, the temple was for the Jewish people. And so Jesus is there, he's teaching. Thousands, we don't know, but, but you can imagine that thousands may have been gathering around to listen to him teach. It makes sense because the day before, he was healing people and he had just cleared the temple. And so as he's teaching, the, these chief priests and the, the elders of the city come to Jesus with this question, which really is one of our biggest questions as people. Whose authority? What authority do you have? Under whose authority do you claim to be king? You cleared the temple. You healed these people. You, you, you're here teaching. What is, what is your claim for your rights to be able to do this? See, again, they had placed themselves at the seat of power, and they wanted to know what gives Jesus the right to claim the throne, so to speak to claim the power. Why? And again, Jesus' response was brilliant. It was not random. You see, John the Baptist came as the Messiah's herald. Remember when he said that uh, to behold the Lamb of God, like John recognized who Jesus was. And, and the religious crowd of the day, they denied the authority that John came with. And so that's one of the reasons why they wouldn't accept Jesus' authority is they, they didn't believe in John's authority. And so today, again, as we think about these stories, I want us to wrestle with who, who is Jesus to us? Is, is he king? Have we settled the authority issue? We want our rights. Look, I get it. I want to be able to do what I want when I want with whomever I want. It's my life. It's my body. It's my choice. I don't want to be pushed. I don't want to be poked. I don't want to be prodded. I don't want anybody to tell me that I can or can't do something in my life. It's just part of who we are as humans. The issue of authority has always been the issue. And so with that, Jesus dives into a couple of parables. This first parable, he's addressing the question, who will enter the kingdom it's not a very long parable. It's a parable about two sons. And so let me just read it. Starting in verse 28. He says, what do you think? I've got a story for you. A man had two sons. And he went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. And that first son answered, I will not. But afterward, he changed his mind and went. And he, the, the man who had two sons, went to the other son and said the same. And he said, I'm on it. I go, sir. Whatever you say, Dad, I am all about it. But did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, well, the first. Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes Go into the kingdom of God before you. And again, he's, he is directly talking to the religious leaders. We cannot imagine how offensive this would have been for them to hear Jesus say these words to them. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed. Believed him. And even when you saw it, you did not afterwards change your minds and believe him. Again, short, simple, straightforward. In the story, who is the authority figure? The authority figure, of course, is the father. He had the authority to tell his sons what he wanted them to do. And culturally, culturally speaking, you didn't question your pop. Very patriarchal society, very patriarchal culture, top down, don't question, you do what you're told. And so the first son... The beginning is the, is the rebellious one. He's the guy who says, no, dad, I don't want to do that. 
It's my life. I can do as I please. I'm going to live in the moment. I'm going to live for my pleasure. I'm going to live for my satisfaction. I'm going to live for my enjoyment. And again, if you're thinking, this is very similar to the prodigal son who said, Dad, give me what's coming to me. I want to go out and do my own thing. The second son on the surface, at least the response, the words out of his mouth give the illusion, the appearance that he's the the good son. Of course, Dad, whatever you want, I'm on it. I'll do it. He's the son who said the right things. But the, the twist in the story, which is not hidden, it's very clear, it's very short and straightforward, right? The twist of the story is the first son is commended. He's commended. Why? Because in the end, he actually did what the father said. He actually did as the father had asked. It moved beyond words to deeds. But what happened? Well, in the story, if you read it, it simply says he changed his mind and went. Now, quick question. He changed his mind and went. What's the Bible word for that? Somebody? Repentance. He repented. Repentance simply is to change your mind. It's going in one direction and going, you know what? I don't want to go in this direction. I'm going to repent. I'm going to change my mind, turn around, and go in a new, different, better direction. And even though the first son, with his word, said, I'm not going to do what you said. It's my life. You don't have authority over me. I have authority over me. He repented. He changed his mind and did what he was told. And again, what Jesus says after telling that story might be one of the most offensive things in all of Scripture. One of the most offensive things, perhaps, that Jesus ever spoke when he said, hey, guys, I just want you to know something. Tax collectors and prostitutes, they're getting into the kingdom ahead of you. And again, just imagine the shock that they would have felt. They, they had all the right answers. They dressed the part They said all of the right things, but Jesus says to them, in essence, that's not the point. That's not what I'm looking for. Those things, outward words, outward appearances, are not what gets you into the kingdom. Why? Why? Well, until you begin actually doing, doing the will of the Father, who has the authority, you are living as your own spiritual and final authority in life. And it's no wonder that those religious leaders, the Pharisees and the chief priests and the elders of the city, there's no wonder that they began to conspire to kill Jesus. He was cutting to the core of their hearts, to the biggest issue that they had to address and were unwilling to repent of. You see, the, 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 the religious crowd, the religious men of those days, they loved their outward piety, saying the right things, dressing the right, the right way, acting the part, but they resisted inward transformation. They were religious, but unrepentant. So how does that apply today? I hope, if you've been in church, you see it. I hope it's kind of easy to see. And in your notes, you want to write this down. It'll be up on the screen. Here's what I said. It's better to live a life of rebellion that leads to repentance than a life of religion without repentance. Now, I'm not saying to go out and live a life of rebellion I heard, I heard you say it, Trent. I'm, here we go. Game on. Woohoo! I'm just saying that it's better for you, and better for me, better for anybody who even though they may have lived and continue to live a life of rebellion against God, but eventually repent, change their mind, and do the will of the Father, then to be the kind of person who shows up in church every day, who carries their Bible who knows the language, who can dress and act the part, but in their heart, they continue to rebel. rebel. They continue to be unrepentant. They continue to be unchanged. It's a mask. That person 
has never settled the authority issue. That person has never really, truly, genuinely given their, their, the, the throne of their heart over to Jesus. We can say it in another familiar way. This parable of the two sons really is a reminder of the old adage, actions speak louder than words. Right? Actions speak louder than words. We, we, we've heard that. We've said that. It's, a, it's, it's an echo of James 1.22 when James wrote this, but be doers of the word and not hearers only. Because if that's the case, you are deceiving yourself. See, your life speaks louder than your words. So my question is, what is your life saying? What is your life saying? This this parable for us is a great reminder that Jesus isn't looking for people who proclaim that he is Lord. He is looking for people who live like he is Lord. They live that way. They've given him the keys to their heart. So this morning, wrestle with that reality. Have you changed your mind? Have you repented and really made the decision to do the will of the Father, to make him the final authority? And if so, what, as, what kind of evidence is there that you have indeed moved from words to actions? Are you proclaiming him as Lord but living like he isn't? Proclaiming him as Lord, but living like he isn't? If that's the case, the good news is you can repent. You can change your mind. So if we look at that question that we started this parable with, who enters the kingdom? The answer is very simple. Those who live under the king's authority. Those who submit, who live under the king's authority. The next parable asks and, 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 and really answers the question, what happens if you reject his authority? What happens if you reject the king's authority? And this one we're going to read and, and talk through. He goes right from that parable, and in verse 33 he says, here another parable. I've got another one for you. This might help you out, you religious leaders. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. And again, get the picture. The master has done everything they're supposed to do. They have a property. They prepared the property. They made everything ready. And when everything was ready, they, they put a you know, for rent sign. Somebody comes and knocks on the door and says, hey, I, I'd like to take care of your vineyard. And they go through the interview process, fills out the application, you know, they, they get approved, and, and that tenant goes in and takes up residence within the, the property where the vineyard is of the master, right? It's a, it's a good deal. The, the, the negotiation was, hey, here's what I'm asking. When the fruit of the vineyard comes, I get some of the fruit. That's my payment. That's what I'm asking for. Let's continue reading. Verse 34 says, when the season for fruit drew near... He sent servants to the tenants to get, what's the next word? His fruit. Belonged to him. It was his property. It was his land. It was his vineyard. And the tenants took his servants, and he beat one and killed another and stoned another. That's, that's not a good response to a good master who invited you into his land and to care for his property, negotiated a good price. You kill and you stone and you beat the servants who are just here to collect the rent. Hmm. Verse 36. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first. I'm going to send a few more, right? More than the first. And they did the same to them. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the sun, they circled up. Huddle, uh, this is the heir. Come and let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. 
when therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? Jesus ends the parable. And these religious leaders, they know the answer. They said to him, well, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their seasons. To which Jesus probably smiled. He says to him, have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God, where, where Jesus is allowed to rule, will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. And, and again, some might have listened to that and was like, I'm not sure exactly what he was saying, but the chief priests and the Pharisees, they got it. Look at what it says. Matthew writes this. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this parable, they perceived that he was speaking about them. Although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowd because they held him to be a prophet. And so they go away and come back at another time. Again, this is this, this parable. There's lots of truths in this story. It's true that when Jesus talks about the son, the master sending his son, he's, he's making reference to himself. He, he is predicting, it's, a, it's another prophecy moment, where he's saying, this is what you guys are about to do to me. And it shouldn't be a surprise because the Old Testament, Old Testament prophet predicted that this is what's going to happen, that you would reject me and that you would kill me. And so he's setting them up for what's now just a few days away. But when I think about this story and I think about authority and I think not just how he was addressing those religious leaders, but, but some 2,000 years later as we, as we build that bridge to apply this story to our life, here's something that stands out to me that I think we need to, we need to consider for a minute. See, the tenants had been hired by the owner but they were acting as if the vineyard belonged to them. That they had the right to do what they wanted with the fruit of the vineyard. You see, I don't know about this. I don't know if this is true about you. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's not. Probably it is, because I think it's true of most of humanity. See, when it comes to our lives, everything in us wants to pretend like we're the owner, not the tenant. And culture, the world constantly reinforces that idea. Your life, your body, your choice. Who is anyone to tell you what you should or shouldn't do? With, and then just fill in the blanks, right? Whatever it is. Who, who, is any, who, who, is, who is anybody to tell you what you should or shouldn't do? There's, there's something in us that, that our knee jerk, whenever we feel pushback, whenever we have somebody say, I don't want it this way, I want it this way. We, th th this is not acceptable. It needs to be like this. Hey, have you thought about it? I really wouldn't want to, I really want to say, like, again, from, from work to home, to inside of a church, to, to, again, just culturally speaking, we push back against anybody trying to assert any kind of authority in our lives. And when we're doing that, what we're saying, if we think about this story, is we're saying that the vineyard really is mine. My life is mine. We don't see ourselves as tenants, other parts of Scripture as stewards. We're not the owners. And it goes back to the question, who owns your life? Who owns your life? Do you see your life as your own or do you see your life as belonging to him? And let me just tease that out. Some of us believe that my life is my own, but because I'm a good guy, because I'm a good gal, I'm going to share some of my life with Jesus. I'm going to give him a few bucks, 
I'm going to give him a few hours. I'm going to give him a few of my thoughts. I mean, it's my life, but I'm going to be generous, and I'm going to, I'm going to share my life with Jesus. How good of me. How righteous of me to share my life with Jesus. That's, some of us think that way. And though we wouldn't necessarily articulate it like that, that's, that's how we live. Jesus is lucky to get a few of my bucks, to get a few of my hours, to get some of my time, to get some of my thoughts. He's lucky. But that's not, that's, that's, that is not the way Jesus intends for us to live. Or we can adopt the right posture. When we think about our life, we recognize that it's his. It's his life. He just allows us to enjoy it. He, he, he gives us the opportunity to enjoy the life that belongs to him that he has given to us to live. That person, their posture is, it's yours, Lord. It's yours. It's all yours. My life is yours. My time is yours. My mind is yours. My, my pocketbook is yours. My talents are yours. It's all yours. My response when I hear your voice, when I hear your instruction, it's going to be yes. My life is not my own. I was bought with a price. And that price cost Jesus his life. See, for a lot of us, if we're honest, we, we think that Jesus is like our GPS system in our car. What do I mean by that? See, you, you get in your car and you punch in where you want to go. You, you decide that you want to have a good life, right? And you recognize that God has something to do with it. So you punch it in and you keep God right there. And God helps you navigate through life. But have you noticed in your car, when you punch in the directions, you still have an option. When the GPS says, get off at this exit, you can go to yourself, I'm not going to obey. I've been there before. I know the shortcut. I know the faster way. I can get there better on my own. I don't need to listen to the GPS. We still have that option. And when we take that option, we hear the GPS tell us, recalculating, recalculating. How many of us right now in our lives, and I'm not trying to trivialize this when I say it, but God has this constant message, recalculating, 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 because we refuse to follow his instructions. So he says, recalculating. I, I want to get you on, on the right path, but if you keep doing your own thing, if you keep living as though you are the final authority, it ain't happening. You'll never end up where I want you to go. You see, if you've decided to follow Jesus, and I, and I know most in this room have made that decision, some you need to make that decision. I'm pleading with you to make that decision. You have become an apprentice of Jesus, one of his followers. Here's the bottom line for your life. God is the owner, not the navigation system. God is the owner of your life. He is not your navigation system. A helpful tool when we need it but we still have the option to do what we want. That's not it. That's not it. We look at the story, and again, we think, how does this connect? Again, as tenants, we have to recognize who the owner is. And we have to recognize that the owner expects us to bear fruit. God expects us to bear fruit for him. Your life and my life, God sends things our way to remind us, where's the fruit? Where's the fruit? Where's the fruit? Could be a, 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 
a time in his word where you're reminded of something and God is saying to you, I'm looking for fruit. Where's it at? Could be a message that you hear on a Sunday morning or through a conversation that you're having with a friend in a, in a smaller setting. It could just be his spirit reminding us. And here's the hard question. How often do we, not literally, figuratively, but in our hearts, do we beat up, kill, and stone that message? Don't want that. Not going to listen to that. Not going to follow that. We reject it. Let me connect that back to the the story of the two sons, and we're going to wrap it up. If you're taking notes, write this down. We are guilty of rejecting the message when we say we are all in, but don't follow through with the instructions of our Father. And when I think about that, that's scary to me because there have been plenty of times that I'm like, I'm all in. But when push comes to shove, I don't follow through. I don't do the thing that I sense that I believe that God has said, I want you to do this. And what am I doing in that moment? I'm not literally killing the son. I'm not killing Jesus, but I am rejecting him. I'm rejecting him and I'm rejecting his authority in my life. And that's a scary thing. Settle the issue of authority. And, and, and you won't just have to settle it once. You're going to have to come back to it again and again and again. Because the moment that we think that we've given Christ ultimate authority, something is going to happen in our life. Some circumstance, some decision. And in that moment, we're going to be tempted to say, I got this. I want to be in control. I want to decide. I want to do what I want to do. Here's the good news. And the worship team, you guys can come. The good news is this. Our Heavenly Father is good. Our Heavenly Father is gracious. And we may live like that first son and often go, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. This is too hard. This is too difficult. I've got other things going on in my life. And, And we all do it. But if we change our mind, if and when we repent and we say, you know what, Dad, you you know what, Father, I'm still going to do what you asked me to do. Even though I was a stinker on the front end, even though I resisted, even though I pushed back, even though I made excuses, I recognize that and I repent. You know what God's going to do? He's going to do what the father in Luke 15, the story of the prodigal son did. He's going to run out to the edge of the property and he's going to throw his arms wide open and he's going to welcome you. He's going to say, I'm glad that you've come to your senses. I'm glad that you've changed your mind. I'm glad that you've repented. Let's throw a party. Let's kill the fatted calf. Let's put on the robe and the ring because I love you and I want nothing more than for you and I to be in relationship, to be connected, to have intimacy with each other. And that happens when we change our mind and we run to the Father. We go back to him. And that might be where some of you are at today. This morning, we're going to go into a time of communion. And my, my, my challenge, my invitation to you is this, is you know, Paul, when he gives the instructions uh, to, to the church about communion, there's a line that a lot of times churches will say, um, and, and pastors will use it maybe to guilt and manipulate, and I, I, that's not my heart. And, but, but Paul talks about examining ourselves before we take communion. And that can look a hundred different ways at, at different times. But here's my specific challenge to you. Take a minute to examine who and where you're at in those two parables. If you're the first son pre-changing your mind. Right now, you're like, I'm just going to do my own thing. I'm not going to listen to the Father. I'm going to, I got too much, like, listen, I get it, but I plead with you to repent, to change your mind. 
and, and your Heavenly Father is ready to throw his arms around you. But you got to change your mind. you got to repent. And if you're here and you're the second son, and even these moments of communion for you just become this, oh, 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 look at me. Watch me. I know how to do this. But your heart is just distant and far. You need to repent as well. You need to change your mind and recognize it's about what's going on inside of you, not what's on the outside. And then you need to wrestle with kind of how you see your life. As a tenant, do you recognize that my life is really not my own? It belongs to someone else? And do I live that way? Or do I try to live as though I'm the owner of my life? Whatever it is that you need to do, if you need to just sit where you're at and pray, repent, tap somebody on the shoulder and say, hey, I need to pray with you about something and pray with them. If you want me or one of the elders to pray with you, take a minute to do that. And then I invite you to, in in God's mercy and grace, come and spend a few minutes remembering Christ's sacrifice. That's what communion is. It's an opportunity for us to reflect and think about, be be grateful for what Christ did on the cross. Because when he died on the cross, he was making a return home. He, He was making bearing fruit. He was making a relationship with the Father possible. And so let's take some time to, to remember Christ's death. And again, if you're new or newish design, we do it different ways. Today, I'll let you do it on your own. We won't do it together. So in a circle or maybe individually, you just take that, that cup, uh, peel off the top part, grab the bread. It's not real bread. It's just this nasty piece of plastic. It's just true. And, and just take a minute to say thank you, Jesus, for your body. Thank you that you suffered for me. And then take the bread in the same way, peel back the the, 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 the next layer that gives you access to the cup. It's just juice, no wine in it, and it's just juice. Take a minute and say thank you for your blood. There, without the shedding of blood, there's no, no repentance, there's no, there's no remission, there's no forgiveness of sin. So take a minute to do that. And again, you can sit in your seat and do that, or you can stand in a corner with a couple of people if you get in a group and do that. Um, this will get a little bit messy, but that's okay. Um, following Jesus can be messy. Um, if you're not a follower of Jesus yet, if you're not yet a Christian and that's the step that you need to take, I'm going to be down front. Jacob's going to be hanging down front. Matt will be here down front. Tap one of us on the shoulder and say, hey, I want to become a Christian today. I want to start following Jesus and we can help you with that. And uh, that'll be great. Father, we love you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. Help us now to reflect and respond according to what you've taught us in and through your word today. We love you, Christ. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's